had pupils coming from all the streets of Barrick Street. So Barrick Street was really special. That was, that was uh, my home. Sullivan's Key was founded in 1828 uh, by Edmund Rice. Edmund Rice was alive at the time and he had opened a similar, uh, similar school in Wathbert. So the Bishop of Cork invited him to open a, key, uh, a school here. And uh, Sullivan's Key was the second, I think, school uh, to be uh, opened. And it catered really for all the children of the area who hadn't access to maybe uh, an education. I started teaching in 64 in Wexford, so I was eight years in Wexford. And then at that time we used to be transferred from place to place, so I was transferred then in 72 to Ennis. I spent eight years, eight uh, glorious years there. And in 80, then they said go down to Cork. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I came down the first year I was, I had third class. I had McFinn actually in, in third class, council on McFinn now. And uh, uh, in 81 then, the summer of 81, they said I, I became principal when Brother Summers left. So I was principal then for the next 25 years. Yeah, well, I suppose I started off in St Mary's of the Isle School, which is just um, by the St Fionbarns Cathedral. And one of the the one things I can remember clearly, even though I was very young, was the walk from there to Sullivan's Quay when we were moving into first class after making our communions. And I suppose one of the things was we had to walk past Ford's funeral home, and we was we were always a bit freaked out by the the activities of that funeral home. And you would be looking in to see was there any dead people there laid out. Um, but we, I remember arriving the first day, and it was our first experience going from the nuns to the Christian Brothers, and it was a bit daunting. Um, but we I had a fantastic time in Sullivan's Key. Um, Brother Ben Cusa came from Clare in my first year there and ended up being there until its closure in 2006. It was a nursery for hurling really for say 40, 50, 50 years, especially the, maybe the 50s and the 60s, 40s, 50s. It was, an, uh, uh, it was a nursery for sport. And like that I suppose, you know, hurling, playing glassy alleys, playing uh, chessies. These were all great activities, very normal activities at the time in a school which had maybe 400 students. Uh, rowing was another sport that they, they were famous at. Uh, so athletics, they were, of course it was a big school then, you know, you probably had six, 700 pupils there. People traveled very far to be, to be in the school. Uh, so you, you had boys in the Polyduff and Toker way out the lock who'd come all the way into Sullivan's Key School, and they were, they were they were able to do that because we had a cheap and efficient public bus service back then. Uh, people had one and a half hours for a school lunch, uh, so it was possible to actually travel back to Toker for your lunch in the middle of the day from school and, and get back in, into school in time. Um, but I had very fond memories of Sullivan's Quay. Um, some great people went there. You had, I remember as well, you had Charlie McCarthy bringing back the Liam McCarthy Cup when Cork won the All-Ireland. Various St Finbar's Hurling and Football Club captains used to come back to the school with the Cups. So they were all fantastic memories. And of course, the annual visit of the Lord Mayor was always a big occasion as well. It was a fairly brutal place. Uh, corporal punishment was, was rife and... Uh, uh, I remember having one teacher who was uh, uh, remarkable because in the entire year he taught us he never hit a single boy and he was just a complete exception, complete exception. But uh, what counteracted, they, they'd see a different broad then when they'd come down at six o'clock. Uh, he started that club the year he arrived and at the, at the start it was designed to help people who were going to the Gwail Tucked for a year and it was an Irish club and it was you know to learn Irish phrases that we wouldn't be lost when we went down to the Gwail Tucked in Ballangary. That continued on maybe for two or three years, Gwail Tucked. And then of course money was scarce at the time so they weren't able to afford maybe the, the fee uh, for the Gwail Tucked. But uh, they continued to come in to me. They'd look in the door below and they might hear a couple of fuckle. Now they didn't want that, but they wanted a, a, a game and they wanted uh, to meet one another. So about 83 or four, then I opened the door, let everybody in. Now I didn't insist on the Gaelga. Up to that, I used to insist on the Gaelga and any bell it was, uh, the cant word was, a walya. But uh, anyway, uh, so they, gradually then the numbers increased. They went up 20, 30, 40, 50, up to nearly 60 some nights. 
and one night wasn't enough. So I opened, I'd say I was open five nights a week for 10, 15 years. And every night I'd have, I'd say 40, maybe 50 kids in, Bukali August Kalini, uh, and they had their games of soccer. We had two little pitches, the yard made into two uh, pitches. We used to call it the Stadium of Light and maybe some other stadium. But uh, soccer was huge there. And it was a fantastic facility for the young people of the area. Kept people off the streets, kept them busy. We used to play hurling and football. Then he eventually got snooker tables. The small ones weren't good enough then after a while. So I got an idea I'd get a big full-size snooker table. And what did I do? I wrote a letter to various schools in the area, various institutions, and I said, would you sponsor the leg of a snooker table? I think there's eight legs on, on a full-size table. So I did. I got... I got enough money actually to buy two tables, two full-size tables. Many people have said uh, down through the years, and people who are now sending their kids there, that it was one of the things that kept them on the straight and narrow and was one of the greatest uh, um, youth clubs in this area. And uh, they used to love coming now. They used to pay <laughs> uh, 20 cents a night, maybe 10 cents at the beginning, 20 cents. And one of the best excuses I got was uh, they'd know 20 cents and they'd say, bro, I went to the shop by accident. Unfortunately, it closed in 2006 with only 13 students, which I suppose reflects the change that happened in this part of the city. It's amazing for me, and I suppose it keeps me going still, uh, 37 years on, when I meet, when I walk up and down Barrack Street or I walk out, uh, uh, out Friar Street or whatever, and I'd meet, uh, or walk around the lock, I'd often meet them, and they'd they all have amazing memories of the club. Well, that's really what kept me going for so long. So we are in Nanonego Place, a very historic uh, site in the centre of Cork City. Uh, the buildings behind me date back to the late 18th century. And most importantly, uh, this is where Nanonego is buried and where she founded the Presentation Sisters. Nanonego lived along, it was then Cove Lane, now Douglas Street. She lived there with her family for from about 1748 or 49, around that time. And she started a little school in a cottage because she saw the kids around the street with no opportunity to lift themselves out of the poverty that they were in. So she did it very quietly, uh, didn't even tell her family because it was against the law at the time to have a school for Catholics. So she rented a mud cabin and she was well off, of course, so she sent out her maid and her maid brought in the local children, 30 for a start, and she started her first little school. It was a mud cabin, so the children were sitting on the floor, and she had a little stool, and she sat on the floor so she would be near the children, not lording it over them. But gradually then she uh, gathered helpers around her, and she started, uh, in the end she had about seven schools, I think, and then she started the Presentation Sisters in 1775. So the buildings and the schools around here, they increased over the years to what you see them today. There was a girls' primary, of course, yes, but there was a boys' primary too. And uh, uh, at that time, uh, they had babies, as we would call them, four-year-olds. You had a middle infants, you had a senior infants in your first class. And I would have taught the uh, very small boys, four-year-olds, one year, and I would have taught um, senior infants another year. And uh, I loved teaching small boys. Uh, it's, a, it's a very historical school. I w began to teach in the secondary school in 1950, and uh, until I retired in 1991. And uh, I must say, it was a very happy, happy, happy time because everything was lovely and relaxed at the time. Do you know, there was, you hadn't the, the running, fussing that you have today. Do you know, that's what I found. And um, the children were lovely. You know, um, they came, you know, you might have two or three families in a house at that time. And, uh, and the streets, like, wouldn't have the cars that they had at all, so you'd hear children playing as well. So I taught, we had the biggest girls secondary school in Ireland at that time. They catered for the local children, first of all. All the children were able to walk here to school, and then the wider area. 
around Berwick Street and then down to the South Terrace, all around the area, all the wide, the whole area catered for. And um, we had very big numbers until the 80s. And they, they began to decline then in the 80s. When I came back here as principal of the secondary school in, uh, in, in the 80s, 1980, as a matter of fact, and I was very aware, I suppose, the 80s, you know, were a very difficult time in Cork. Uh, the, uh, unemployment was very high. Uh, it was the, the, the decade when Fords and Dunlops closed. And uh, as I said, unemployment rate was, was extremely high. And um, I saw it was the, the, the worst of times and the best of times. Some of the pupils now are, you know, are as if to something very, as if they belonged, you know, and we belong to them and they belong to us. That's the only way you could say it. Oh, I think there was a very close bond between the school and the parents and the people of the area and the parish as well. And uh, there were great care taken of the poor children. Then the population changed. They moved out to the suburbs. The sisters themselves built a couple of schools out Ballyfahan, out in Turner's Cross. And bit by bit, the numbers in the school here dwindled until uh, the middle 1990s, I think a decision had to be made to close the secondary school, first of all. And that was a fairly traumatic moment. But once the school buildings were empty, the sisters were resourceful and they said, what can we do with the buildings? And what is the need in the city at this particular time? And they turned the old secondary school building into social housing. The more the numbers went down, the more creative and innovative we became. And then the primary school closed. So again, more empty buildings. At the same time, the number of sisters here decreased rapidly. The uh, religious orders weren't attracting as many young women to join. And we could see the writing on the wall for these buildings as well. Oh, for a long, long time, the sisters were planning and wondering. And finally, in about the year 2011, the decision was made to hand over the whole site to a company, a limited company. And uh, the directors of the company began planning and began designing a new future and new life for all buildings. Uh, we're just coming to the close of a three year repair and restoration project. Uh, and we'll be opening up a heritage center to Nanonagel. We'll be opening up the grounds to Corkonians. Uh, we'll be putting in a community and education centre behind me here. And we're building an educational facility uh, at the end of the site. There'll be several things happening here. There'll be heritage, archives, hospitality and ministry. They're the four big things. Uh, when people come to the site, um, they'll come through a lovely reception on Douglas Street with a very beautiful shop and then up and into extensive grounds of three and a half acres. Um, the Heritage Centre is in the 19th century chapel, but also extends into the earlier 18th century buildings. The graveyard is also open um, at the end of the gardens here. It would be wonderful to let people relax. That is really what I think people need to do today is relax and to come in here you know, and feel, because they all feel that wonder when you come into our, our garden. In keeping something of the old while giving something of the new, it, it, mixing those two together, which isn't an easy one at all for, for architects, uh, I think people have taken out a book on Anna O'Neill maybe and learned something about her. Everything is going to be in the tradition of, and the spirit of Nan O'Neill, and I think that is very important to keep on that tradition. Uh, well, Nano Nagel Place is on Douglas Street, which I sort of think is a, sort of like a cousin to Barrack Street. Um, so hopefully it'll have a really positive impact on both streets. We really want to embed ourselves in the local community. People feel that they can come in here, whether it's just to visit Nano Nagel's grave, to sit down and read a book, to come to the restaurant, to come to classes here. Um, it'll bring jobs to the area because we're bringing so many people to the area. Uh, so hopefully it'll have a really positive effect.